Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to a uh, our, the next rendition of Steampunk Academy's uh, Drunk Science Virtual Science Happy Hour. Uh, we're sitting here in our backyard this time because t this week we've got um, some pretty cool stuff going on. We've got a panel of people that are going to talk about um, the bio blitzes that you can do and participate in in your neighborhood uh, and to kind of pass the time while we are stuck doing not a whole lot more than short walks around our parks and backyards. Um, so we're pretty excited to hear from a lot of the great people that we're going to introduce here shortly. Um, so to start off with, Sky, what are you drinking? I am drinking Detour IPA from our very own Uinta. It's outdoor themed. I wish I were camping. <laughs> I'm drinking a, apparently it's called a Hooky Bob. IPA from somewhere in Colorado. I'm not sure what a hooky bob is, but it looks like it might be a bison with moose antlers. So <laughs> you probably win a big prize if you can find that I don't think out that's in your a neighborhood. Thing. Could be. Thing. Might be. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's get started. We're going to start with introductions and then we're going to open it up to a fun, kind of casual panel conversation. All right. First up is our dear friend Ellen. So, Ellen. How about you introduce yourself and tell us what you're drinking? Sounds great. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Erickson, the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Natural History Museum of Utah. Thrilled to be here with you. Woo. Woo. Uh, this <laughs> evening, I am drinking a cold glass of Red Rocks Saison, which I love. And it's uh, French, Le Quatre. That's not how you pronounce it, but that's how I'm pronouncing it here. Woo. Um, so. I'm glad to be sharing a glass with you tonight. <laughs> uh, so I, as a citizen science coordinator at the museum, get to do a lot of fun sort of community engagement things with the community. And so part of that is um, doing a lot of cool it's science engagement. And so citizen science, if you aren't familiar, is really anytime members of the public are participating in scientific research that's helping professionally trained scientists, as in people who have gone to school. So it's like people like us, I'm not a professionally trained scientist, um, average members of the community who take part in the scientific process in some way. And so this upcoming weekend, there's a pretty exciting um, challenge that's happening. It's called the City Nature Challenge. It's a global citizen science event. It's over four days, April 24th to the 27th. Um, so it starts on Friday and ends on Monday. And the whole point of this challenge is globally for people to record as much biodiversity as they can in their communities. And so clearly there's some different stuff happening in the world right now. And so traditionally I would be hosting bio blitzes with the museum and we'd be going out into city parks and having these big public events where people come help us bio blitz the parks and record all of the nature that's hanging out there. We're not doing that, um, we're gonna be socially responsible uh, and, and recreate responsibly, if you will. And so um, we're asking people to do it from their home and from their communities and even from inside their house um, or from areas that they feel comfortable going to in, in a safe and responsible way. And so to participate, it's pretty easy. All you need to do is download a free app. And where's my phone? Of course, I've lost it now that I'm here. Um, there's an app online, it's called iNaturalist. And it's an amazing platform that's built on photos of things in the natural world that people have taken. And so you get iNaturalist on your phone and then you hang out outside or inside and you look for stuff that's wild and alive. And so when I say wild, I guess I mean, don't take pictures of your dog, don't take pictures of the <laughs> cat that's running around, um, but you can take pictures of anything else that's occurring naturally. So a fly that's going by, a magpie in the tree, a robin that's hanging out, dandelions in your yard. I have lots of them. <laughs> All of those are great candidates for pictures you can take on iNaturalist. So you take a picture of it and it gets saved. The location and the date and the time are automatically associated with the photo, which is awesome. And then there's a cool AI functionality. And so when um, you take the photo and, and you can hit this little button that says, what did you see? And it's gonna think about the picture you took and it iNaturalist will suggest to you what it thinks that species is that you're looking at. And so if you don't know that it's a dandelion, um, iNaturalist will tell you that, which is great because you learn a little bit about something that's in your yard or in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then when you hit save, it automatically becomes this data point that's accessible to anyone on the globe online, um, which is amazing. And so that becomes this cool little puzzle piece, if you will, of biodiversity. And so if we're looking at, you know, what's the spread of dandelions worldwide, you can look that up on iNaturalist right now online. They also have a, a web a web platform that's this they're connected they're the same thing you could look it up online and it'll show up all these little dots of every observation that's ever been made of an, a dandelion on my naturalist and you could look for years you could it's really cool um and so you can see if things have been sort of spreading and moving and the natural history museum has a couple different projects where we're looking at um, species that have been introduced to the state of utah and we're tracking their movement essentially on i naturalist which is awesome and so the point of all of this is that you have nature hanging out right in your yard and the cracks in your driveway or in the sidewalk in front of wherever you live, outside of your windows flying by, or even if you're like me and have a basement, <laughs> spiders hanging out probably really close to me right now that I'm going to be looking for this weekend for the City Nature Challenge. Um, take a picture of what you see and you'll learn a little bit and then you'll also be contributing to science in some pretty awesome ways. Um, and sometimes you don't even really know if you're taking a picture of something that could be useful and exciting to science. And maybe it would be some kind of groundbreaking thing, like we've never seen that species here before, which is possible. Mm -hmm. um, more likely you're just gonna be taking a picture of something that we see all the time, but that kind of thing is important too, because it turns out the nature living, especially in urban settings is not super studied. So we're not, we don't know a lot about the species that are living around us and how they're impacted by humans. And there's all this interesting stuff coming out now, if you've been seeing this online about how um, like their impacts on species based on how the world has kind of stopped and all this human activity has slowed down. And so people are starting to notice cool stuff they had never noticed before. And so you might even be noticing that now in your home, seeing things that you hadn't noticed before. And so all of this data is a pretty cool thing for us to collect and also pretty cool that it's going to be this global effort. So there are, there are 200 plus other cities in 39 plus countries that are going to be doing the same thing. And so represent Utah and help us make some observations on a naturalist. Awesome. That's, that's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it's cool that it's part of history, <laughs> even in our unfortunate circumstances, we can learn, yeah. hopefully learn mm -hmm. some interesting stuff about how human behavior affects all these animals. Um, totally. yeah, I think now we're going to go through and, and introduce everyone else who are going to talk a little bit more about what kind of things you're going to see out there. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Yeah. Hello, Ria. Hello, Ria. How are you doing? Good. Uh, How are you? Yeah. <laughs> Great. So start off with what you're drinking there. Today I have a uh, Ketos mm -hmm. Blackberry Sour, uh, which I've never had before. I'm loving it. I love Ketos from our local breweries. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. And I'm the volunteer and outreach coordinator at the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center in Park City. So, not too far away from Salt Lake. And in my spare time, I'm an insect enthusiast. Um, love insects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the most common insects we see. Um, so I'm going to share this real quick with you guys. Let me know if you can see it. Yeah, we got it. You see a screen. Cool. Yep. Let me pull this up. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, infinite loop. Cool. Most common insects. So I went on a walk today in my neighborhood and just kind of made little mental note about um, insects that I was seeing. Um, why should we care about insects? Why should we look for them? Uh, you might not even have to leave your house to see some insects for the City Nature Challenge. Uh, if you have a basement like Ellen's or just any kind of house that might have some insects in it. So today I saw some beetles. Who doesn't love ladybugs? Love ladybugs. Um, Things like moths and butterflies I'm starting to see a lot of. And this is a tiger moth right here, which is a pretty common uh, type of moth in the Wasatch Front. Box elder bugs. If you live in Salt Lake, you are super familiar with these guys. Um, and like Ellen was saying, even though they're common, um, getting data in the City Nature Challenge for these common species is still super important. Um, one of my favorite things that I love bees, just like that 
gif of Oprah talking about the bees, uh, <laughs> which are so cute. So a lot of times people are like, oh, bugs are gross. I don't like them. They're icky. Um, there's so much diversity. And once you kind of look up close at these small insects, like look how cute these bees are. They're like little teddy bears. So in the middle, we've got our honeybee here. So this is a European honeybee, but there's blue mason bees and green. This one's super small, this little sweat bee, so cute. Mining bees that live all over the place. Um, Utah has like 900 species plus of native bees. So that includes all these guys on the outside. Um, one of my favorite parts about bees is that they're actually pretty easy to observe for the City Nature Challenge. So if you're trying to take pictures of bees, what I like to do is go bee watching. Um, so I kind of stake out some flowering plants. And right now there's some daffodils and tulips around my neighborhood uh, and right down the street and in my neighbor's yard, flowering trees. So I'll kind of see where there's any kind of movement with insects um, and kind of stake out a spot and observe what kind of pollinators are coming there. You're able to get great pictures. You can take videos uh, and then iNaturalist can help you ID those guys. Uh, and once you start paying attention to these things, they're they're really cute. Um, most of these native bees don't have stingers and don't sting. So if that's one thing where you're like, I don't want to mess with insects, I don't want to get bitten, I don't want to get stung, bees are great to observe. Um, I would recommend just not touching any insects, leaving them alone and letting them do their thing and just observe them respectfully. Um, like Ellen said, the Natural History Museum has a couple projects. One of my favorite is the firebugs of Utah. So this guy, the firebug here, looks pretty similar to a box elder bug. Um, so you might not have noticed it before if, if you've seen one. Uh, and it's an invasive species, uh, European firebugs. Um, and they have a whole project tracking these. So it's really important to track the spread. Um, and see where they're moving, how their numbers are changing. And so you can do that with your observations. Uh, you can go to the, just Google Firebugs of Utah, that Natural History Museum project will come up and you can kind of see the differences between box elder bugs and them, and then uh, submit your sightings to that project this weekend. Cool, sounds exciting. Yeah. And we will uh, we'll send out links to everything um, that people are talking about, too, so you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about scrambling down uh, names of websites or anything if you're out there listening right now. Um, cool. cool. Cheers. Thanks. Now let's Cheers. hear from Patrick up in Cache Valley. Hi, Patrick. Hey, hey how's it going? What refreshing beverage do you have? I have some Buffalo Trace bourbon, just drinking Ooh. it neat. Harkening right. back to the good old days when we had bison out in the east. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. yeah. Yeah. Tell us about what you're doing up there at the Stokes Nature Center. Yeah. So I'm up at Stokes Nature Center here in Cache Valley, and I'm the director of education up there. And we're nestled right inside the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest, just in Logan Canyon there. And super jazz to get people excited for a city nature challenge up here in Cache Valley. I really, really love Cache Valley. It's a super happening place. And we just got unbelievable biodiversity that's just exploding right now. So I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite things in the world, and that's plants, things that grow and flower. And it's spring. It's high time for plants. Um, they're all over the place. Um, and it's just fantastic. <laughs> cool. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, with the City Nature Challenge, I really like focusing on plants. Number one, they don't move. You don't gotta try and pin something down or see something in the sky and be like, what What the heck is that? Um, it's just right there for you to identify. Um, and you know, not everything's flowering right now. So what I really like to do is focus on leaves and leaf structures. So if it's a tree, I'll get sort of like a far away shot and then I'll go in and with my camera, get a shot of those leaves because oftentimes that's all we really have to identify those plants right now. But the good thing about plants, they don't move. So you can always come back later when they are flowering. And <laughs> like, oh yeah, it was a dandelion. It was a pound's tongue or whatever you think you might have. So that's one of my favorite things about those. 
And then, you know, we do have a number of flowers out right now. Ellen mentioned dandelions. Those are great. I've just been going through my yard every day and like three times a day, plucking all the heads off the dandelions, trying to kill those suckers. <laughs> <laughs> so my whole yard doesn't turn yellow. Uh, you know, we have our typical spring flowers or crocuses. They're beautiful. They're purple. They actually start photosynthesizing oftentimes underneath the snow. And so they come out, they're ready to go. They're pretty gung ho. Um, we got tulips, daffodils. You know, you're not supposed to take pictures of things that aren't wild, but I still take pictures of tulips and daffodils because they're pretty and they're great. And you might find a nice insect in those guys, which is really just like a double whammy. I've definitely yeah. got some iNaturalist entries where it's like, it's both a flower and a bee. And that's been really great. And then we've got glacier lilies up in the high alpine that are starting to sprout out right now. And then I just went out this afternoon, went collecting and uh, old fashioned slideshow. Uh, got a fairly uh, balsam root. So this little uh, aster, these guys are popping out all over the place. So take a look out there. These guys are fantastic. Uh, they smell really fun. They kind of smell like an old leather chair that's been sitting in a cigar shop, which is like, <laughs> like oddly specific, but I smell it. Like, I was like, this reminds me of an old leather chair that's been sitting in a cigar shop. But uh, yeah. Is the the hipsters or something? <laughs> I'm a naturalist for hipsters too. It's it doesn't discriminate. It's it's beautiful. But uh, yeah, I've been really loving all the spring bloom that's out here, and can't wait for more this weekend. Going out and just taking pictures of each and every flower and leaf and everything like that. Cool. Awesome. I have so many questions, but yeah. I'll have to save them for later. Yeah. Um, I'm excited Absolutely. to hear yeah. more. <laughs> Uh, looks like coming up now we have uh, Lucila and Jamie. Hey. Hello. Hey. How's everyone doing? Great, great. 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 What are I'm, you drinking? Good. <laughs> I'm Lucila Fernandez. I'm a conservation outreach biologist over at Tracy Aviary. I work with the conservation team and I do a lot of our outreach functions. So. I kind of do the biology, but I talk your ear off uh, more about it than I do the biology. Um, and today, what I'm drinking, I unfortunately am really low on alcohol. So I made a survival cocktail, uh, which is pretty much a hot toddy. But instead of lemon juice, I have orange juice in here that I squeezed and I tried to make it all nice and fancy. <laughs> and I'm calling it a lazuli toddy. Um, for anyone who knows what the lazuli bunting mm -hmm. is, it has kind of like this orangey color on its breast, and that's kind of the color I think I got in this drink. So I tried. <laughs> Love it, resourceful. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Jamie? I'm Jamie Butler. I run Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College, and we work to connect people to Great Salt Lake through research and education. And I found this awesome drink that I'm drinking today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Great Salt Lake flavored LaCroix because I can't get enough of Great Salt Lake. I never shut up about it. Um, so cheers. <laughs> cheers. Um, so this is so this is actually an original piece of artwork from Natalie Mella. So if anybody needs some like really cool, like fun local art, um, go to Natalie Mella on Instagram. <laughs> Awesome. So what are you what are you here talking about today? Yeah. Uh, so as an aviary, we thought that we might it might be kind of fun to talk about some birds that you'll see around town. And Jamie has some other tips as well, too, um, for birds that she sees at closer to the Great Salt Lake and also some rivers and lakes that you might see um, in town as well. Um, but before I start listing off just birds, I don't have slides, but I do have a little bird friend with me. <laughs> and this is one that you might recognize around town. It's called a downy woodpecker. And if you look, I've actually been seeing them um, pretty active in trees, just kind of walking out um, close to downtown. And you're gonna try to look for them. Um, I've been seeing them doing this really cool thing where they're kind of like courting each other. So you'll see a male kind of chasing a female. And it looks like two of them just kind of hopping around. And then maybe you might get lucky enough to see the male fluttering its little wings. Um, and if you happen to catch those sorts of behaviors from birds, it's kind of an easier way to record what, um, what kind of bird it is than to get just a picture. Take a little video. This is kind of a birder's secret for uploading things onto iNaturalist because 
as you well know, if you've tried to look at birds, some of those suckers don't stay still. Uh, so a little video clip is a great way to go. And in place of some pictures, I wanted to highlight another really easy way to try to find some birds, especially the common ones and the ones that are singing right now, is to use your birder's ear. So no need for binoculars, just use your eyes, use your ear. And Jamie has another um, fun tip um, that she'll talk more about using your eyes. Um, and so I have a little clip here and I thought it'd be fun to show off some birds that like foods that we're probably craving right now in quarantine. <laughs> uh, so if you've ever heard of the black cap chickadee, um, those guys are everywhere. Um, I like to remember them by what it sounds like they're saying when they're singing. And it sounds like they're saying hot dog, cheeseburger. <laughs> so I'll play that for you now and let me know if you can't hear it. I can try to raise the volume a little bit. There's a hot dog. Cheeseburger. <laughs> That's a really great way. And that bird, um, you'll hear it singing first thing in the morning. Um, and it will sing all day. So it doesn't matter what time of day you're going out and about. You're likely to hear this bird kind of calling for some snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other bird I wanted to show off to you, and then I'll... Um, tag team Jamie into this um, is the, um, oh, let's do this one, the American Goldfinch. I really like this bird too, because it also kind of says a snack name <laughs> and it often does it as it's flying. So if you look up in the sky, um, especially if you see sunflowers around you, you're likely to see this bird because they love picking those little seeds off. And you're gonna see something kind of jumping up and down in the sky. And it's going to be kind of tweeting potato chip. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll see if I can get that in this song um, recording that I have here. So it has kind of like a messy link of songs. It says hiya, like that's another one, kind of like a cowboy. <laughs> oh, I might not have the potato chip in this one. So you guys can hear that yeah, that's the cowboy sound. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last bird that I think is kind of special and um, that I want to highlight because I've seen people reporting it on iNaturalist and on eBird, which is another citizen science app that's very similar to iNaturalist, but only for birds. It's called the broad-tailed hummingbird, and I like to call it kind of like the rambunctious cricket of the sky because it sounds like a cricket and people often hear it and they don't think it's a bird, but it's actually a bird. So I'm gonna play that for you now. So that chirping and that buzzing is not a cricket and a bee having a battle. It is one bird making all of that sound and it's super loud. So if you hear that, Again, get your phone out, take a little video, get, uh, use voice memo. And those are ways that are really easy to identify on um, iNaturalist when people look at your record. Um, the other thing is that it's OK if you don't know what the bird is because they are really fast. Go ahead and just label it as a bird when you uh, upload it. Um, <laughs> and we're so excited to go out and do the City Nature Challenge with you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to give you some more tips about some cool water birds and shorebirds. Well, and, and I'm with Lou, like I'm kind of, well, I don't know if you're a lazy birder, but I'm a lazy birder. And when I started working at Great Salt Lake, all I ever heard about was these. <laughs> Everybody knows what these are. These are flamingos. And there was this one flamingo that lived at Great Salt Lake for many years and he hung out with the gulls. And um, birders would, would flock everywhere to find Pink Floyd, the flamingo. And I'm kind of with um, the folks that don't like not everybody has binoculars, not everybody has a spotting scope. And so a lot of what we do is um, I do naked birding is what I call it. And naked birding is a fun way to say, I'm going to do stuff without, I'm going to go look at birds without binoculars, without a spotting scope. And I'm just going to look and see uh, what these birds are and identify unique characteristics. Like maybe they have a stripe on their neck. 
killdeer are little tiny birds that you see at Great Salt Lake and oftentimes in the rocky sides of roads um, where they nest and they have this beautiful necklace around their neck. And and also um, the, there are little avocets and maybe you can't go to Great Salt Lake, you're practicing the social distancing and we all wanna be very responsible and maybe you can't go to Great Salt Lake, but there are all these places that you might see some water birds like the pond at Liberty Park or the pond at Sugar House or Decker Lake. Um, and I did hear, um, Lou actually alerted me to this, that we were seeing pelicans. Does everybody know pelicans? Pelicans were at Decker Lake and we've even seen them out at Liberty Park. And sometimes we see them at Fairmont Park. We see them along the Jordan River Causeway. And so all of these places that you can see these like beautiful birds um, are right in your neighborhood. I do want to share my screen with you for just a minute here. Um, one of the projects that we run at Westminster um, is called the Pelican Project because um, 11,000 pelicans nest at Great Salt Lake. And maybe you can't go see them in the City Nature Challenge. We totally understand that. It, they're very hard to see. They're very shy birds. You can go to this um, zooniverse.org and look at the Pelican Project. And you can help us classify over half a million pictures of pelicans that are breeding at Great Salt Lake. We watch them when they migrate. Um, we see all sorts of interesting behavior on this program, um, like this pelican that's just flying in. Um, this is something that you can do from your computer and we don't wanna take that away from um, the City Nature Challenge at all. We want you to go out and look at things and just know that many birds like California gulls, I mean, everybody knows what a gull looks like. Um, mallard ducks, quack, quack, quack. Those are the quack, quack, quack ducks. Um, <laughs> Um, and even, even pelicans you might see in your immediate vicinity. And if you can get out to Great Salt Lake, I wanted to show you this really cool thing. Can you see these? <laughs> these are my favorite invertebrates. They're <laughs> but, um, live in Great Salt Lake. And so if for some reason you can get out to Great Salt Lake, you could um, put this into iNaturalist. Awesome. <laughs> and cool. I do just want to make one quick correction. I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier about video files. Um, that is something that you can do on eBird, um, but not on iNaturalist. So for iNaturalist, make sure to do those voice memos along with the picture if you can get it. If you can't, don't worry about it. Awesome. Cool, cool. cool. Well, we have one more person to introduce. Uh, here on the Wasatch Front, uh, and then we're going to switch over and have a big group discussion. So, Daniela, where are you at? Hello, <laughs> how are you doing? Uh, so, I think we have oh. your. We got to unmute you real quick. All there right, we go. Better? Yes. yes there you are. Okay. Great. Awesome. Um, so, I'm with the Hutchings Museum and Institute down in Lehigh. Um, a lot of our projects this year are, especially for the, the City Nature Challenge, are going to be right around Utah Lake and the Jordan River down here. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about what animals and birds and insects, which are all animals, of course, to, to look for at night and the special ways that there are to maybe identify them. Sometimes we forget that it's a, it's a whole different world after dark out there and, and some of the things that, that trigger that and some ways to help everybody um, find that. So were we just doing the introductions right now or did you want us to give our little presentation right now? Yeah, just yeah. a brief introduction and brief uh, presentation for sure. Okay. Uh, and then so, we'll go into a big group together. Yeah. Perfect. And then I'm sure more questions will come up and I'd be happy to answer them then. Um, you can set up some really fun things to kind of trap um, not trap like as in kill, but like get them to come to, you know, you've all, everybody's mm -hmm. heard the, like a moth to a flame. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things are really attracted to light. Um, and so that's a really great way to uh, screen 
here with you guys. Okay, now that I have that figured out. Okay, is it, can you see that? Uh, it hasn't come up yet on our end. You see yourselves on there? There it is. Okay. Um, a, just a really easy way to attract a lot of moths is is almost set up like a scarecrow, you stick <laughs> shirt or something like that out there, and then you can literally you can just get a get a lawn chair or something, just sit down, take a take a look, and you'll just be amazed at how many things um, will be drawn to to the light at night. Great way to get a lot of different moths and things like that. Um, the we we like to use a. Uh, we've got an infrared camera that we actually like to use to cheat with um, the owls, everything that comes out at night. Um, you can't tell where they are, but if, if you have access to something like an infrared camera, those are really great or nighttime goggles. It's, it's fun to get out a lot of the cool sleuthing stuff um, to, you know, to see things at night. One of the things that, that does come out at night. So I'll share this link um if you guys can get it out to everybody mm -hmm. where it has all the instructions for basically how to, how to build a, a, a scarecrow to attract some of the nighttime um, critters that come, that come by. Cool. Um, cool. The, the other big one at night that is really a sensitive one right now are bats that come out at night. Uh, we've had some other people already discuss the threat to pollinators that we've got here. Um, not just with bees, but bats are actually the third largest pollinator. And with everything that's going on with COVID, um, as you, re, any rehabilitation centers and stuff right now, we can't take bats. If anybody brings in an injured bat, they need to be put down. Um, more for the, well, the fear is more that the COVID will jump from humans to bats. We don't think the bats here have it yet, but they could be carrying other things as well. Unfortunately, this fear has also led to people damaging bat boxes, mm -hmm. um, just injuring bats, just because of you know fear and lack of understanding. Uh, uh, bats just you know don't go try to pet one. It's a wild animal; <laughs> they may bite to defend themselves there, um, but they they're super fun to watch at night if you if you know where you know where they are they really help keep mosquitoes down so we want bats we want lots of bats they pollinate they keep mosquitoes down they they're just a really really cool animal um the the other thing i was going to say to to really look out for is right at dusk there's a certain time if we're standing out here by the lake i'm sure you see it in other places or hear it in other places all of a sudden it's like a switch flip and you start hearing all the nighttime sounds. So mm -hmm. you'll be all of a sudden you'll hear like the crickets just turn on or the frogs mm -hmm. just turn on or toads. Um, listen for that. I don't know if there's a good way to document the sounds that we hear. Um, is there, does anybody know? Is there a way to? I think said iNaturalist can accept um, audio, uh, files. audio files. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that um, really, because there's going to be a lot of things that we can't see, but they come out at night and we'll be able to hear them that way. Um, but yeah, nighttime is look up, look down. There's a lot of things that come in bed. Dusk is a really fun time when, um, you know, things come down to different like watering holes. If you have places that you're going to be looking um, specifically and just uh even things that you do during the day to attract birds and things to your yard. If you want to set out some, some seed, just keep in mind that cats are not native. They're a very invasive species and they like to hunt at night too. So uh, be careful that you're not attracting birds to your yard only to have your cat uh, kill them once they get there. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, that's go out, at, go out at night. It's my favorite, my favorite time. Awesome. Well, I have, I have so many questions, but we'll, we'll get to those. Um, so now what we're going to do now that we have our introductions out there, uh, we're going to open it up. It's We're going to have all our guests in kind of a big panel um, roundtable discussion, if you will. Uh, Sky and I are going to are gonna sneak away and get another drink. And uh, Jamie's going to take it from here, I think. Okay, so Patrick, I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
the the crocuses they photosynthesize under the snow how does that work some of them can yeah so the uv light can penetrate through some amount of the depth when just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's not at least some radiation getting through <laughs> like my mind is blown when you said that i was like ah <laughs> crazy you, and, <laughs> do other plants do that too i'm not a botanist so i don't know the answer to that but perhaps perhaps okay i do have a question for ellen too so you talked about, you know, maybe some groundbreaking discoveries that had happened, you know, just through like citizen science. Do you have any examples of that that you can kind of talk about? Yeah, I well, and I mean, I could, but I don't want to take up everybody's time. I will. I can tell you a short story about an iNaturalist success um, that might maybe inspire people. So there was a so. This was a, years ago, but the, um, there was somebody who was hanging out in the Cook Islands, which is very far from here. And they took a photo of a snail and they put the picture of that snail on iNaturalist. And uh, when you post something to iNaturalist, there's also this sort of conversation that happens between other users of the site. And so people will say, oh, you've labeled this as being a certain kind of snail. And I actually know a lot about snails. And so I actually think it's a different subspecies of the snail. And so there was this conversation going on and, and a, a debate of sorts between snail people about what this snail was. Um, and after a, a, a stretch of time and lots of comments, they realized that in fact, the snail that had been photographed was a snail that no one had ever seen a photograph of the only record of it was only a, a drawing a nature drawing that had been, uh, done by Captain Cook, Captain James Cook, when he was exploring the seas. Um, and so, and no one had ever photographed the snail. And so that was an iNaturalist observation. And so when I said, you never know what you could be photographing, you never know what you could be photographing. You might just think it's a snail, but it could be really important to science. So I think that's a pretty cool story. I need to look at the comments too, but I have a question for, oh, so um, Isaac wants to know, how can we promote or encourage and protect pollinators, bees, pollinators, all of the moths and birds? We love our pollinators. Uh, I'll start off on this one. Um, I love pollinators. I could talk about them for hours and hours, but I won't do that right now. Um, one is limiting your pesticide use for sure. That just indiscriminately kills insects so it doesn't only kill insects that you don't want on your plant it also kills pollinators that might be coming to your garden so limiting pesticide use is great also planting native plants um, that attract pollinators so not only are insects pollinators but things like hummingbirds so tracy aviary might be able to uh id for you um planting Flowering plants that flower at all these different times throughout the year. So ones that flower in the spring, ones that flower in the summer, ones in the fall, uh, to not only feed the pollinators um, in the spring when you're starting to see them, but all year round. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep with you because we have um, a question about box elder bug sex, which I think is very important. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it is it box elder bug mating season? Like people, Jonathan King is constantly seeing bugs stuck together. Is that what is that what's going on? <laughs> they are stuck together. Uh, yeah, I think they're definitely mating and not just uh, not observing social distancing protocol. <laughs> I don't know about uh, if there's a specific mating season. Or if maybe there's multiple, they might be able to mate multiple times throughout the year and have multiple eggs, broods. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think they're starting to mate now, and I don't know exactly about the timeline of box elder bug mating, but I know what I'm going to read about tonight after this. <laughs> <laughs> I I like am very intrigued by brain shrimp sex. Which is, like, <laughs> here just so we know like there are these like brine shrimp that are coupled and fourth graders in particular are very hard to like <laughs> explain what's going on <laughs> um hey so um 
when is a plant a weed? Why do we call plants weeds? Why do you know? It's a matter of perspective. <laughs> and a lot of the plants that we call weeds, a lot of them sometimes they'll be invasive or they have a domineering aspect over America's largest crop, which is grass. Um, and we don't usually like that because we like our manicured lawns. But a lot of what we call weeds, we can we can use. Uh, there's this old adage: the more you know, the less you need, which is pretty apt right now as we're all making sourdoughs and what have you. And you know, if you know how to use a dandelion that doesn't have pesticide or herbicide on it, you can eat every part of that flower if you really want. Throw some of those leaves in a salad, or you can take the root, wash it good, and if you steep it in boiling water, it makes a terrible coffee substitute, but some people love it. Um, so really it's just a matter of your perspective and if you want to see it as an enemy or if you want to see it as just a, a plant that's growing there that maybe you don't love at first, but then grow to be fond of. <laughs> I'll add to that, uh, Patrick, it's, I've, I've heard it said that a weed is a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. Um, and that isn't that just profound? Um, but it it's also a matter of of location. And honestly, um, that there's so many like life lessons in in nature, right? And and how we see it grow and develop. But a weed, oftentimes we will consider something a weed if it's growing in the wrong place or we didn't put it there on purpose. So straw, like if anybody's ever grown a strawberry patch, mm -hmm. um, it can start to send off shoots out, right? And become um, like crazy. I had hollyhocks that are great pollinators. I put them there on purpose, but every one of them spreads like a million seeds. That becomes like a, a weed in, in a way that it's just, that's not where you want it. It becomes a weed to you. Um, but but yeah, I think right along the same lines, it's just, do you want it there? And what, what is it going to be, you know, used for, for sure. I have a question about bats. So is there a way to like illuminate an area so that you can see bats? How do you best observe bats to see them better? If you know where bats are, you know, hanging out, um, then just go into those areas like right after dusk, close to water. They eat so, so many mosquitoes. So here out here in Saratoga Springs by Utah Lake, we've got some caves up in the hill. We know the bats live up there. So if you go down by, by the water, you can you can hear them or um, they fly very, very quietly, but you can see them. They're not like moths where you where you would set up a light and they're they would be drawn to that. It's more of a, a location. Um, but I think a lot of people see bats without realizing what they're looking at at night. Um, if, you'll, if you just be a little bit more still and a little bit more quiet, that dark flutter in the air oftentimes is, is a bat. There, there's a lot more of them than we think. And I find, you know, birds, they seem to have a regular flight pattern, like flickers, you know, they kind of fly doot, doot and you see them fly, the bats seem to be more irregular. Yeah, and they're they, very abrupt little bursts of energy. Just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. right. Um, okay, I'm asking a very important question. I have huge spiders in my house. Um, <laughs> I naturally suggest that they're wolf spiders and they get so big. Are they friends or foes? <laughs> Wolf spiders are definitely a friend, definitely a friend. They're scary looking, I know, and they get big, but they, they're actually really helpful, especially in your house. They eat other things that you don't like to have around. And I think that's something that spiders are often overlooked for, um, much like bats, like they're eating things that we don't always like to have around. And so they're, think of a wolf spider as an, an awesome roommate who wants to stay out of your way and help keep um, pests down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep them around. <laughs> and I so um, I help run, it's called Spider Fest on Antelope Island that happens in August. And we're definitely re-envisioning that this year because of the coronavirus. But um, every year there are 
bazillions of spiders. I mean, in a bush the size of a washing machine, you can find over a hundred spiders that are really like this big, like they're enormous and all they are, they're um, Western spotted orb weavers. And so maybe I think it was seven years ago, we started this um, festival thinking about them. And I've learned about spiders a lot since then. And I hear a lot of people talking about, about brown recluse or black widows here. Who knows, are there brown recluse in, in Utah? Mm -mm. No, they're not. <laughs> no. No. Black widows, yes, but brown, black brown, brown recluse, no. And so black widows, I mean, like they cause problems, but they're not, you know, like they're not gonna kill you, right? Uh, they can. They're not <laughs> aggressive. Um, if you see a black widow in your house, um, you can try and relocate it. Their venom is definitely really potent, and so you want to avoid them. And if they're in your house, uh, that can be an issue for if you're really young, if you're really old. It can also be an issue for your pets. Uh, like if you have a dog or cat that gets bitten, um, they're not paying attention to IDing spiders. Uh, or are they? But uh, that can be an issue. Yes. Black widows, you definitely want to stay away from. They're, they're very, very painful bites. Have you been bitten? I haven't, but I, um, one of my neighbor's children was, and it was excruciating. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it can really mess with you. People can be really allergic to their venom as well. So they can cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Isaac says his cat is horrible at IDing spiders. <laughs> um, it, okay, so for Rhea, what is the, the name of the black and red insects that are all over Salt Lake City? Oh, yeah. So that's probably referring to box elder bugs, which are about as common in Utah as fry sauce. Um, so like a, a centimeter long um, long, dark charcoal with some red uh, box elder bugs. They are herbivores and it's mating season perhaps, uh, but they are all over the place on trees. Um, can you eat them with fry sauce? I see. <laughs> I've never tried it. Might be a good weekend, a good city nature challenge or d'oeuvre to try this weekend and maybe let us know. Yeah, just photograph it first, please. Yes. <laughs> Take a picture, then get some protein. Yeah. Bugs well, are great protein. I come from Great Salt Lake, and I'm always, like, amazed at these stories about the gulls, because the gulls, they came in, and the first year that the Mormon settlers were here, the gulls came in, and they ate all of the Mormon crickets that were decimating all of these crops that the that these settlers had made. And, and the gulls, they would eat all of these crickets, and then they would go vomit it up, and they would eat more of these crickets and go vomit it up. And I... I'm always like, why did why did these settlers not just eat the crickets? Like there were so so much an awesome nutrition there, right? <laughs> it's manna. Oh, okay. So we do have a question about ants. Um, I need to find it. Okay, so today Jen Brown was cleaning out a flower bed and jacked up a lovely little ant colony. What do I need to do to make sure that they get back to life as usual? Oh, I love that. Um, I love ants. Uh, they are really incredible insects. They're, they're you social, so they have this incredible social structure. Um, there's I don't know how you would relocate them if you need to do that, but they are so good at their jobs, which is building their colony, protecting their colony, getting food for their colony, um, no matter what size that is. Some ants have huge colonies and some have colonies that are like 20 ants. Um, so I think just leaving them alone, um, they will rebuild. They are hardwired to rebuild their nest uh, if it's been disturbed and they're really good at it. Cool. Okay, so I have one more question and then we can take off. Um, Ellen, can you remind us of all of the dates and you know the details of the City Nature Challenge? 
Totally. I'm happy to do it. So City Nature Challenge kicks off this Friday, April 24th, and it's happening all through the weekend. And it ends at 11.59 p.m. on Monday, the 27th. And so you've got lots of nighttime hours there on Monday to finish up your nighttime observations um, with your t-shirt out in the yard, which I love, Daniela. That was, I was cracking up with your t-shirt. Um, awesome. I'm doing that. Um, so it's going all weekend. So it's, it's an awesome time to be out whatever times of day work for you, whatever the weather's doing. Um, get out, try to make a, make a challenge for yourself to just get out and take a couple photos every day if you can. The Natural History Museum has a website up uh, online. It's uh, nhmu.utah.edu slash challenge. And there's information there about all of our awesome partners. We have 18 different partners um, across the state who are helping do great things. Some of them or everyone here on, on the call tonight is, is a part of that group. Um, and so there are awesome organizations helping get the word out to their networks and, and really um, inspiring people to take part. And I will say in closing, um, in addition to a huge thanks to all of our awesome partners who are joining us in the, the awesome conversation that we've had tonight, I, I learned a lot um, from you all. I, it's, it's crazy times. Research shows that when you get outside or even just interact with nature from your window, that is a healthy practice, both mentally um, and physically too, it lowers blood pressure, blood pressure, and there, there are a lot of awesome studies that showcase the, and highlight the benefits of nature on us as humans. And so take the City Nature Challenge as an awesome way to kind of give yourself an excuse to get out and try to record some nature using the, iNatur the iNaturalist app, um, but then keep at it iNaturalist works all year long. eBird works all year long. And there are lots of other awesome citizen science projects and things you can get engaged with if you need an excuse to get yourself outside and really enjoying the beautiful place that we live in. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> I, I do have one more question here on the live comments. Have you seen species return since the quarantine? So. You know, like we've been seeing some things like jellyfish in like the canals in Venice. Has anybody seen anything like that so far? I can't speak to Utah stuff specifically. I was reading an article today that was talking about people thinking species are sort of returning to the, the DC area, the metro DC area and some some things. And, and part of what the, art, the article argued was that really those species were there all the time, which I agree with humans just happen to be changing our practices. And so there was a fox, like a little a, a, a fox kit that had its head stuck in a peanut butter jar or something. And someone saw it and they're like, oh, and they rescued it and saved this fox's life. Awesome. Um, and, and they were saying that really, if you know the person who found it had been at work like they normally would have been, um, they wouldn't have seen it happen. And so um, I, I'm sure there's some awesome data that's gonna be coming out of what we're living in now. And I think more of a great reason to be recording biodiversity because um, there might be some cool shifts that we're seeing in some in some various species movement. Um, but I will say for the time being, there might just be stuff that has been there all along that we just didn't ever notice because we were living at a totally different pace. So a silver lining of all this craziness, so you should take it a little slower and notice the stuff hanging out in your yard. Yeah, and to add to that, um, we also at Tracy Aviary are not sure what we're going to see this season and are very curious. Um, we've been continuing to do some bird surveys in interest of seeing if there might be more bird activity, maybe just because humans aren't around and they might be more active or because we might be noticing them a bit more just to just like Ellen said. I was listening to a fun little piece on KRCL last week about a poet who was talking about noticing bird songs. And a big part of her story was just about being able to slow down and listen to them because she just hadn't heard it or picked it out from background noise previous to now. So now's a really great opportunity to kind of just practice those skills and open your eyes, kind of lean your ears into, into your surrounding and see what you're noticing. Um, and we, are pretty stoked to see what comes in through the City Nature Challenge and other citizen science projects that were mentioned tonight and see if at the end of this, there may have been a peak or not. Um, it is definitely a question in progress and you are gonna be a part of us discovering that. So we're so excited to have everyone who's tuning in and will participate this weekend on our team.
I'm definitely going to make some challenges to some people. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Ellen, for you guys that have done this before, are there any species in Utah that have been particularly hard to find that we know are here but haven't been seen? I don't know. She's thinking really hard or she's frozen. <laughs> I think she's frozen. <laughs> she's frozen. Such a great pose. <laughs> great. <laughs> I really stumped her. Look at that. <laughs> no, you asked her a hard hitting question. This is wow. my gosh. <laughs> you got to be careful uh, with questions coming from you. <laughs> yeah. Scary. Well, does anybody else have an answer to that? Do you guys, have you guys participated in this before your organizations? This is the first time that we've that um, the Hutchings Museum and Institute is participating in the big Utah one. Yeah, we participated last year in Memory Grove. Um, we saw a lot of the same species that were kind of mentioned tonight. Um, that's a, a fairly urban park. Um, but I'm curious to see what happens this year. Um, let's see if we can get Ellen back in here to, to try and make you. Did any of you guys also participate last year? I don't recall seeing things that I didn't already know, but We've I've done bio, bl bio blitzes in the past, but um, uh oh. Uh -oh. My technology is progressively failing everyone. <laughs> I know technology. <laughs> I've already told you that I'm a naked birder, and so like not all of the time do I know like the little brown bird that's sitting in my tree. I know that when I see, you know, a Stellar's Jay or whatever, I can see those, or I can see these like um, wonderful birds at Great Salt Lake, them at like pelicans. But I, I don't know of anything like groundbreaking. Well, that's what people need to do for the next week or so is go find those groundbreaking things. Yeah. Yeah. Find Sasquatch. He's out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Curious. yeah. A fun bird yeah. challenge that might be a little unique if people spot it this weekend, I'd be pretty excited about. There's um this kind of like grayish and black and white tiny little bird. Um it's called a yellow rumped warbler because it's on top of its butt. It has a little yellow patch. And they call it the butter butt. So if you saw something like that, we would be pretty excited. What is it called again? Um, the street name is butter butt, but it's actually <laughs> called a yellow round warbler. Right. <laughs> this has been amazing. Um, so much to learn still, but I mean, I think it was a great introduction into everything you all are doing. Uh, we will be sure to share out on our social media all of their organizations, all their websites, social media information about the apps that were discussed. Um, and so look for those. Uh, you can always re-watch this video also on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Um, so, yeah, I think. Yeah, so I just want to make a quick shout out to the Utah Arts Alliance. They have been a wonderful partner for Steampunk Academy. Um, and uh, I also want to let you all know what's happening next. So on April 28th, which is next Tuesday, we're going to have Isaac talking to some of his friends about food science and about how you can um, make amazing bread all by yourself. Because I'm which sure a lot that's of what everyone's <laughs> doing these days. <laughs> if you can find flour <laughs> at the grocery store, in addition to your toilet paper, you can make some bread. Um, and then on the on May 5th, we're going to have uh, Tracy Avery back with us. <laughs> we're going to talk about the dark skies. And that'll be in, you should take notes, because there will be a trivia night on May 9th for dark skies trivia. <laughs> I love it. Well, cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking some time out to have this chat with us and to listen to the, to the chat. And uh, go enjoy your backyards. I'm excited. Um, myself, because we live right by the Jordan River Trail, so I know I need to spend more time out there for the next week or so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Well, cheers, yeah. everyone. Cheers. Good night. Thank you.